and welcome to today's Conceived Baby Discussion. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that we do hear thrown around a lot these days when it comes to health and well-being, and that's our microbiome. But today we're really delving deeper into this topic and looking specifically at the vaginal microbiome and the impact it has on fertility and conception, as well as the progression of a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. But firstly, if you haven't joined us before, my name is Tasha Jennings, founder of Conceive Baby. I'm a naturopath and nutritionist, seeing fertility patients all over Australia via Skype and Zoom, author of The Vitamins Guide and The Fertility Diet, and the director of Zycia, which means life and provides the practitioner prenatal supplement, Zycia Natal Nutrients. And today I'm thrilled to uh, be speaking with a fabulous expert whose mission and research is really breaking new ground in our understanding of the vaginal microbiome and the influence it has on our reproductive health. And that's Moira Bradfield, founder of Intimate Ecology Clinical and Education Services. Moira is a naturopath, acupuncturist and educator with over 18 years clinical experience. She has a passion for helping people experience optimal health in sustainable and sensible ways. Clinically, she has a niche and interest in recurrent vaginal infections, the vaginal microbiome, and their associated impact on health and disease, including fertility, pregnancy loss, and postpartum health. Moira holds a Bachelor of Naturopathy, Southern Cross University, a master's degree in acupuncture from Southern Cross University, and is completing formal research with Griffiths University as part of PhD studies in the area of the vaginal microbiome and conditions of vaginal dysbiosis. In addition to her role as a naturopath, Moira has lectured in naturopathy both overseas and in Australia and is currently Senior Lecturer for Nutrition at Endeavour College of Natural Health in Southport. So welcome, Moira. Thank you for having me. What a great intro. <laughs> well, it really is a credit to you, the work you've been doing. It's a, it's a real pleasure to have you speaking with us today and a real personal thrill for me. I think your work in this area is really breaking new ground in our understanding of this very important area and particularly as it relates to our reproductive health. Yeah, definitely. It's an area I guess a lot of people don't think of when they're thinking about conception and pregnancy. Exactly. And it's, I guess it's an area that we hear a lot, as I mentioned, about, but generally in relation to, to gut. And a lot of people don't even understand what is a microbiome. So perhaps even let's I guess start really simply with, with going back to the basics. What are we talking about when we talk about a microbiome? Yeah, so the microbiome is a word that describes the collection of bacteria or microbes living within a site in the body. So I have this interest in the vaginal microbiome, so those microbes that inhabit the vaginal space. And I'm sure you've talked about the gut microbiome before. Mm. There's an eye microbiome. There's a, you know, a milk microbiome. We have an oral microbiome. So wherever there's a space essentially where microbes reside in our body that are working for us as humans, um, that work together in a collection or, you know, to provide health or to provide metabolites or chemicals that actually our body can actually use and enhance its health as well so the vagina has one of those mm -hmm. and um, we want it to be balanced because a balanced microbiome or one that's working towards health for us is a better place to be than one that's actually imbalanced or working towards disease states yeah when we were talking about balance i mean we're with the gut versus the the vaginal microbiome there obviously is a difference in in the the lactobacilli and what the what bacteria are in there and we can have you know a gut bacteria that's fine and perhaps a dysbiotic vaginal microbiome so what is what is the difference and and what sort of bacteria are in our vaginal microbiome should we as a healthy yeah that's a really great, really great question so um we often if you've looked into the gut or the microbiome that we have there we talk about diversity which means how many different types of microbes exist within that space and when we're looking at the digestive system it's actually more beneficial for us to have a greater diversity so to have a, a greater range of different microbes but when we go into the vaginal space we actually flip that over it's more beneficial for us to have a low diversity and that low diversity is fantastic if it's made up of lactobacilli 
bacteria. So there's lots of different species of lactobacilli bacteria. They all play slightly different roles and they all have the ability to a certain degree to produce things like lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide, which maintain the pH or the acid balance in the vagina, which is a big part of the health in that area. So the diversity is the big difference and we don't want that area to be diverse if it is if there are greater numbers of different types of microbes in that area, we're considering that to be imbalanced, and that's the term we use, which is dysbiosis. Okay, so that's the predominant bacteria in the in vagina microbiome is the lactobacilli, is the one I guess we predominantly want to see there? In, in most people. So there are exceptions to that in that we yep. do have people that have lower lactobacilli and have perfectly um, working vagina microbiomes or balanced vagina microbiomes, and there's research that looks at that and the categorize them into groups and they call them community state subtypes. Um, but in general, the majority of those groups that they like vaginas to be at, that they notice have a greater protection against infection, are ones that carry lactobacilli bacteria in greater numbers. Yeah. And obviously it's a very dynamic system as well. So, you know, you, it's, it's constantly changing in our life stages and also just menstrual cycle stages, uh, I guess, as, as well. So the influence of hormones. So particularly estrogen for women, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. So can you just, I guess, talk about the, the influence of estrogen on our vagina microbiome and, and how those changes, changes occur? Yeah, you're right. It is a really dynamic environment. Just like if we have a menstrual cycle, it's a very dynamic interplay of hormones going up and down and fluctuating. Mm. And the lactobacilli or the microbes that exist in that space exist on the surface or the, the tissue that's in there and they need fuel and their fuel source is glycogen. And so the body produces that in those cells and that interacts with some enzymes in that space. But the greatest influence on how much glycogen is made by those cells or expressed by those cells is actually estrogen. So in a cycle where we see higher estrogen amounts or where we see estrogen um, higher than progesterone at, at normal parts of the cycle, we would assume that there's greater amounts of glycogen, which means greater amounts of fuel for lactobacilli survival. It also means that you know a balanced hormonal cycle and one that is a bit more predictable, that doesn't have excessive amounts of estrogen or doesn't have um, you know troughs of estrogen that we see menopause uh, is is beneficial for us because when that happens we get an imbalance in those microbes and an imbalance in the lactobacilli and those sorts of hormones I'm sure you've talked about as well you know influence a menstrual cycle particularly and if we get uh, a bleed or a menstrual cycle that is really long or prolonged or heavy that will change that environment as well and influence those microbes and cause different microbes to um, grow and proliferate in that area. So excessive blood or long bleeds change the pH and that means it's a different environment and generally in that space lactobacilli deplete a little bit. Okay, and that's when we be, I guess, more prone to the infections in, in that area. And I guess I'll we'll just talk a little bit to infections. Candida is probably the one that everyone knows about and mm -hmm. I guess Whenever there's a discharge, it's, it's naturally assumed it, it's it's candida um, or thrush, um, more commonly known as. Can we talk a little bit more about, I guess, the types of candida and, and thrush and, and what that presentation is? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It is assumed that any discharge that comes out of that area is thrush. And, and this is mm. one of the big points of my education is that not every discharge is thrush. In fact, when we look at the... Um, you know, which ones are more common, the discharge associated with a thing called bacterial vaginosis, which is a bacterial imbalance state, is actually more common in females than thrushes. Okay. And um, so, you know, when we look at the impact on fertility, we actually should be looking more at bacterial vaginosis than we are looking at thrush. Um, so to be able to understand that, we do have to know what those discharges are like and order how they are actually different. And the discharge of thrush is usually one that we associate with a lot of itch or discomfort. There can be, um, you know, chunky cottage cheese-like um, type discharge. It, it can come really at any point in the cycle, but it's very common um, around mid-cycle or ovulation um, because it is associated actually with higher amounts of estrogen because that will also feed um, thrush or influence thrush levels or candida levels. And um, in that space, depending upon if it's the first time you've had it or whether it's something that happens quite frequently, the, the symptoms can be anywhere from very extreme to very mild. 
But the key is that we don't actually know it's thrush until we get a swab and we have that identified because there can be quite normal ovulatory discharge and normal cyclical discharge that may appear a little bit white or a little bit chunky and that could still be normal. And we don't want to be going in and treating that with antifungals or you know over-the-counter medic medications without actually identifying that because the repercussions of that, particularly if you're trying to conceive, might be quite huge in that you're actually in creating imbalances in other areas. Um, you know, and those medications generally are not, particularly if you're using them orally, are not suggested in pregnancy or conception either. So the discharge of thrush is that, and then the discharge of bacterial vaginosis is different in that it can be quite wet or there can be quite a large volume of discharge. It can be a little bit milky or gray in coloration. And the discharge of bacterial vaginosis is the one that has that odor that we associate or we call fishy. And again, mm. it can be quite mild through to quite extreme odor. So, and it can come and go. A lot of the time I, I come across uh, people who have had discharges that come and go through their cycle because it is quite heavily linked to what your estrogen levels are doing and therefore what your microbes are doing. And so by the time they realise they've got a discharge and they should do something about it, the body's actually sorted it out because the hormones have shifted. Um, so, you know, these things can be very low grade but for very long periods of time. And the repercussions of that can be quite interesting as well because it is suggestive that they're imbalanced, that they need to be addressed and supported. And when we talk about the influence of that on conception, it, you know, it's a really important thing that if you're experiencing discharge that you actually get that identified or start addressing it by working with a practitioner who has experience in that area. Yeah, and I, I do find that quite a bit in, in patients having recurrent um, infections. So if, if someone is having, I guess, recurrent thrush infections or what they deem to be recurrent thrush infections, what would you suggest is the first protocol for them rather than using that topical treatment all the time, which I have had patients come to me doing and you probably have yourself. Yeah, so to be called recurrent, you only really have to have it four times in a year when we're looking at thrush. Mm. Um, and for when people come to me and they tell me that that's what's happening to them, my first protocol is to push them to go and visit their GP or to go and visit a sexual health clinic and actually get that discharge swabbed and identified because sometimes we're not dealing with thrush at all and sometimes we are but we're dealing with different species that wouldn't respond to the over-the-counter um, treatment anyway and so that requires a different treatment approach. Um, so that would be my first point of call is you need to know what you're dealing with and, and if you're continuously treating it over-the-counter, you know, you're not breaking the cycle of it. and there are different ways that we need to address this as well. I mean, I know mainstream on the internet, the, the general approach to recurrent thrush is change your diet and restrict everything. And clinically, I have seen that do nothing but make people lose weight, become generally unwell and still have thrush. Or, you know, to break their diet on one day means a thrush rebound and and that's not healing at all mm. so we need to be able to address it in ways that means that we're clearing that infection or we're supporting the body to overcome that and to keep it at bay um so looking at i know for me when i talk to my clients we talk about their immune system in general um, we look at what might be going on with their hormones and how we might be able to balance that out and generally in those conditions we're seeing uh, some menstrual irregularities or some aberrancies going on so they need addressing um, i look at their overall vaginal health as well so um, often there are histories of other types of infections of things like chlamydia perhaps in there or that there may be trauma as well which can sometimes influence this area so all of those things are important in breaking that recurrency but identification is the first step that we need to take so I guess identifying what we're dealing with and then getting to the cause of the problem because, as we said, just treating that infection is not really getting to the bottom of the problem. So, yeah, looking at the hormones and things like that, which I think is is so important because we are seeing infections, uh, I'm particularly seeing infections playing quite a role in infertility health and, and particularly inability to conceive and quite often unexplained infertility. And I guess we spoke about candida and bacterial vaginosis, which which I do test for, and urea plasma and mycoplasma are another two that, that I always um, often screen for if, it, if it's indicated in, in the question taking. Can you just, I guess, talk to them a little bit and, and how the microbiome is involved in, in those infections as well? Yeah, so it's interesting with uh, mycoplasmas and urea plasmas because 
in the research world, they still don't really know what the impact of that is. But mm. if you talk to anybody working in fertility, they will tell you that if it's identified and they clear it, then that makes a difference to conception. And we know that, you know, obviously if we're looking at conception, there's two people usually involved in that or who are attempting to conceive. And so there's also crosstalk between the microbiome of a male and a female in that situation as well. And sometimes those microbes are passed back and forth and they can exist in that space and cause no symptoms whatsoever. But in the background, what they understand if they are looking at the impact on fertility is that there's a background immune response that goes on with those particular microbes and those particular microbes can sometimes be a little bit hard to eradicate as well. So usually I'm sure you've experienced this that people have been on a bit of a fertility journey and to test for those particular microbes via a high vaginal swab is sort of one of those things that happens later on in the journey when it mm. should be happening well at the beginning. Um, and there certainly are IVF specialists and fertility specialists out there that are doing it much earlier on. But that's usually a bit on a background of miscarriage or, you know, quite prolonged attempts at try, attempting to conceive. Um, but it, they are just two microbes in a area that has a lot of different microbes. And it's the balance of those microbes that dictate how healthy that particular area is. So if they're existing in there, then usually there are other things going on as well. And, you know, these are microbes that the, might be creating that immune response in the background. And the flow on effects of that is we often see not being caused by those microbes in the background but there can often be other types of immune issues going on for that um, that person in their history you know viruses that haven't cleared or autoimmune conditions that are there as well so it's just part of that bigger picture for me I know that I'll identify that and then possibly we need to go forth and address that in um, some more specific ways for people so that they can optimize their chances of conception by whichever way they're actually trying to do that. Yes, it's all part of the bigger picture. It's a, a piece in the puzzle, um, as I say. Like most, most testing, I guess, that we get done are, are that. No, nothing is a single bullet. I do find with fertility, there's generally not one thing that's the issue. There's there's a few pieces to the puzzle, which often go hand in hand. As you said, it's the infection that causes the immune response and can lead to autoimmune, inflammation. It, it's very much um, a linked system, but all pieces to the puzzle. But as you said, it's a shame that people aren't getting these tested early enough. And, you know, I do work with some great specialists who are testing for it, but even by the time they've got to that IVF specialist, there's a, there's a, there's a usually a bit of heartache that has mm -hmm. gone before that. Um, yep. And I know we're talking off air that we both had struggles with our fertility um, and so know the, the the heartache that goes alongside that. So it, it's good for people to be aware of what they can do to to improve their, their chances right off the bat. Yeah, definitely. I think in that as well, having that first-hand experience, it's also being mindful that if something like that is identified it doesn't necessarily mean that is the one factor as well that's yes. causing that issue because it's still something that there are unknowns about and, and it's worth addressing, but you have to be really on board and across everything in terms of optimising it for everyone involved, not just the female. Absolutely, because I mean, as you said, those infections can be present, and I know I've seen it, you know, listed on tests that this is a normal part of the the um, vaginal, you know, bacteria. So as to to for some people, it may not be causing a problem. For others, it, it can be a more more serious problem. And I know I, I love the um, the quote. It's it's far more important to know what sort of person has a disease than what sort of disease has a person. And I think that's that's a Hippocratic quote that I always go back to and I think it's really important that we do know the person. So yes, we have this test result, but how is this test result fitting into the picture, as you said, of their immune system, of their history? And you know, I often talk about we've had our eggs for our whole life since we were in our, our mother's womb. So all of those things and immune challenges over the time can, can influence our fertility health. So, mm -hmm. and. I was asked recently um, about to, to ask you particularly about group B strep, um, mm -hmm. which I do a lot of nurse education. I said, look, please ask her about this. This is something that we do. Obviously, later in pregnancy, it becomes an issue and with the birth. Can we just talk a little bit about group, group B strep and, and what issues, it, it complications it causes in pregnancy and what we can do about it in relation to the microbiome? 
Yeah, so, I mean, it is one of those microbes as well that may just be existing there, mm. not causing any symptoms, not having any problems. And for a small percentage of people, it becomes a problem in later pregnancy and in birth and then mm. postpartum for an infant. And and that's the thing is that we certainly, depending on where you are in Australia, there are different types of screening for group B strep. So there's universal screening and then there's elective screening as well. Um, I know I, I live in Queensland, so we're, we're not universally screening. You get to choose if you're screened for or not. And then um, depending upon the outcomes of your screening, then that dictates what type of interventions may occur within the birthing process itself with antibiotics. So with group B strep as a microbe, it has the ability in a small percentage of people, and I say a small percentage, but it's still meaningful because we are talking about babies here and their you know, first, first life essentially and mm. what can and can't happen there. And, and the consequences are devastating if it does occur. Um, so in, in that percentage of people, it can cause um, preterm birth, so it can certainly, you know, it as a microbe from the vaginal space can move across the membranes and into um, you know and affect the neonate it can then also in the early I mean there's two different types of infection there's the very acute that happens within the first few days of life and then that can be up to weeks later where group heat strep actually causes some issues so there's neonatal sepsis that can occur um, you know so quite significant de degrees of distress that can occur and and life-threatening in a, a small percentage of um, infants as well mm. so it is an important thing to consider the the thing about group b strep is that once you've identified it depending upon who your caregiver is you you may be given a chance to try and rectify that and be re-swabbed i mean they don't start swabbing until past 36 weeks anyway because it is something that you could prove positive for and then it disappears yeah <laughs> and you don't have and then it comes um and so they're just you know adapting those guidelines and then some hospitals where there isn't universal screening they've got the wait and watch approach and that they're looking for signs of distress in the neonate and then um, adapting care and, and acting based on that and they also take into consideration the previous history you know, in terms of previous pregnancies and whether group B was an issue in those and what birth outcomes there were as well and and if you've had a prior group B in, in infection then generally that means in the subsequent pregnancies that you're then on the antibiotics and you know which happens via IV during the birthing every four hours um, and that may present some restrictions on terms of movement in birthing and, and all of those sort of things so it, it is an interesting situation so where the approach I take to group B strep is that I don't want any neonate to have complications mm. <laughs> um, and you know if, if that is there then I would consider even as a naturopath that I would go down an antibiotic route and address the risk and um, and then address the and mop it up later in terms of what can I do to optimize bacteria in this space um, but for me, prevention. So if you're working in a preconception space, that is when you can take the most proactive um, stance against the possibility of group B strep because within that situation, it's another sign of imbalance within the vaginal microenvironment. So if you can optimise your vaginal microenvironment and your microbiome prior to conception, you not only optimise conception itself, you optimise birth outcomes and you optimise, um, you know, the and minimise the risk of preterm labour and all of those things that really impact it on people and, and their babies. So, um, you know, and there is some research out there that suggests that lactobacilli specifically, even when there's been a positive for group B in pregnancy, can actually turn around a significant amount of um, group B strep infections. But it does depend on how long you're using that therapy for. When they've replicated those studies, they haven't always come out with the same results. So it's quite variable and dependent upon the ind individual as well. So you're better off starting off knowing you're going into it with some optimal health um, and then strategizing around it if it comes up later. Or if you're in the position where they're not universally screening and you get to go with a wait and watch approach, then it's still, you know, the antibiotics are still available, but it means that they are watching to see if there's any signs or issues with the um, post-birth. 
And as you said, prevention is, is better than cure in, in most cases and definitely in this case. So if we, you know, we can get, get it in that preconception period and improve the vaginal microbiome in that period, not only can we prevent those, those kind of infections that we're talking about, but obviously, you know, the healthy vaginal microbiome has been shown to improve conception, improve, you know, IVF conception or natural conception, not just, not just about the infections and I guess preventing disease states. It's also about optimising chances of conception. And I know I, I saw say that the lactobacilli, if they find that in, in the catheter, um, during the IVF transfers, there's a greater chance of a successful transfer. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that study was looking, they were, once they'd done the embryo transfer, were sampling the tips of the catheter, which would have picked yeah. up microbes from the vaginal environment. And for those that had transferred lactobacilli, uh, which would be suggest that that is present in that vagina, they had a greater live birth and um, IVF success rate associated with it. Um, and then when they found other microbes that we would associate with being a, so, uh, dysbiosis or, you know, imbalanced, uh, they had, you know, poorer IVF outcomes. And these are still sm small studies, but they're mm. meaningful because the outcomes with IVF statistically, depending upon your age, um, you know, you, it's not fantastic all the time. And so yeah. you really want to optimise your chances in any way possible, you know. So along with, um, you know, for some clients, I will work with them in how we can specifically really make sure their lactobacilli is up in that pre-embryo um, transfer stage um, and, you know, not or in conception stage or whatever stage we're at, we just need to be considering that. And if there are changes, you know, they need to be addressed. If you've got a history where you've had infections prior to conception, you know, you need to spend some time in that three-month period that most preconception protocols have working yeah. on the vagina as well and not just working on your diet and, and, you know, sperm health and all those other things that comes into play. It's a whole picture. And the vagina is a pretty important part of conception. Um, and in terms of external influences, you know, depending upon how you're attempting to conceive, you know, some people are having sex as frequently as every day, which is a constant um, challenge to the vagina to actually recover, um, particularly if there's ejaculation taking place. So these things, you know, you want to optimise that. You want to make sure your vaginal microspace can rebound and maintain its lactobacilli. Um, so all of these things should be discussions that you're having with your practitioner. So not being shy about discussing your frequency of sex and the type of sex that you're having and, you know, what's going on with your vaginal discharge or does it smell funky or what's going on? These, they need to be talked about because you're not going to be able to identify it if you don't talk about it. Um, and, and this is a huge thing in clinical practice. I know if for me as a client, if I wasn't asked about something, I wouldn't say it. Mm. Um, and <laughs> so if you're not being asked about it, just bring it up because it is important to your conception health and, and the ability to be able to conceive or to carry a baby as well. And I love that message because I think it is something that we're either ashamed of or or shy about. And when it comes to fertility, we, we need to put those feelings aside. If this is going to influence your chances of conceiving and carrying your baby, it's something that needs to be discussed, is really important to be discussed. I know I got an email I just uh, this morning with a patient because I, I do ask all, obviously all those questions and she said, I'm sorry, too much information. I'm like, no, please, no, never too much information. We need to, to know what's going on in that area because, as you said, it's such an important area, the vagina, for conception, yet funnily enough, not one that we think we a great deal think about. We think about our diet and the sperm health and all those things. Yeah, that's right. And we talk about menstrual cycles and ovulation, yeah. but, yeah. I mean, it wasn't that long so that, I mean, I went through an IVF round to conceive and that was nearly six years, seven years ago now. Um, mm. No, I was never asked about my vaginal health, my sexual health history, any of those things um, that would may have impacted my uh, chances of conceiving prior to even moving into IVF. Um, and it's not that that is bad practice, it's just that this is new science. Um, and so it needs to be taken up and incorporated into that sort of questioning and screening. And if that's not happening, bring it up yourself because it is important um, that you, if you've had that type of history, if your vagina seems like it's got a discharge on a pretty frequent basis, that that's identified, dealt with, out of the way, moving into conception, you know, in the best of health. 
And as you said, and speak, you with, said, your, speak with your, being your own, being your your own doctor, in a way. doctor in a way. Because a lot, because of, these, a lot of these, I'm getting a bit of feedback there. Are you hearing me twice? Are you hearing me twice? Or? Or? No, I'm only hearing you once. Good. All right. Good. I'll keep All going right. there. I'll keep going there. That's me. But as we discussed off air, my training didn't involve the microbiome, particularly the vaginal microbiome. So a lot of practitioners may not be aware of what's going on in, in these areas. areas. So, so be your own advocate. Your own advocate. Also, on that also note, on that note, what can people do can people to improve, do their, to improve their, their vaginal environment vaginal on their own, environment I, guess. On their own I guess? Washing, cleansing, cleansing what do you suggest in that area? Yeah, none of those things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 so uh, essentially the vagina, when it's balanced, should be self-cleaning. Mm. It doesn't need us to scrub it to make it smell like flowers. It's meant to smell like a vagina um, and it's meant to discharge you know liquids and and those things are perfectly normal in varying degrees for different people depending on what's going on so my recommendations are that if you're using soaps or if you're having to deodorize or use wipes or any of those things then perhaps you need to actually have a checkup just to check in on the health of your vagina outside of that I would stop using those things water mm. is plenty enough to wash your vagina and your vulval area with well you're not actually washing your vagina washing your vulva um, which is the external anatomy and um and you know maybe using a flannel if you need to get into the grooves and get some things out but ultimately the less you disturb the area the better the microbial balance will be um, if you are experiencing issues with your menstrual cycle, I would suggest that you seek help with that in terms of uh, working with how you can optimise your hormones and balance them out. And, and this is very different than going on the contraceptive of some sort. This is about working with your body's rhythms and clearing out your hormonal pathways. Um, so seeking help in those areas um, because that will also influence your vaginal health. Um, you know, and, and choosing things that are good for your vagina. So inevitably when we wash in the shower, if we're washing our hair with shampoo or conditioner, there is going to be um, rundown from, on our bodies into the vulval area. So choosing good quality, chemical-free um, personal care products is important in this area. Um, and, you know, for our whole body really, if you're in that preconception stage, you should be you know getting rid of anything that's not serving you anyway um so those would be my key tips eat well you know obviously moderate our nervous system and our stress response all of these things impact that area and you really don't need to be manipulating anything around there you know inserting things or doing anything douching for example um, unless that's being recommended by a health professional for a very specific reason and in order to do that as I said you need to have your discharge identified and the issue named and um, know what's going on in that area so less is more <laughs> mm. um, and clean living is fantastic and um, seeking help when we need it. I guess on that I guess on note, that of personal, note care, of personal care, what is, is what your is advice your on advice tampons, tampons versus, versus menstrual, menstrual, menstrual cups, cups that are available, that are available these days, these or, days pads. or pads? What, what, would what would you recommend? I recommend whatever you are comfortable with mm -hmm. that fits in with your lifestyle. There are some considerations for all of those things based on chemicals and exposures. And so if you're using pads or tampons, um, you know, choose an organic variety. Um, changing them frequently you know so certainly the longer we leave something in our body the more opportunity it has to grow microbes and again if you're imbalanced then you're going to possibly have a little bit more issue in that area so um, you know not everybody likes tampons you know not everybody likes pads so that is a personal choice and then the use of menstrual cups has certainly gained popularity in recent years they've been around for a good 20 odd years but mm. they seem to have hit an explosion and they're fantastic on many levels particularly on an environmental and financial level for a user but there are considerations as well because the selling feature of um, cups these days is that you can leave them in for up to 12 hours and that you can just simply empty them in the toilet or um, um, and all of those things carry risk for us when we're looking at microbes in a space. And so we need to make sure that we're cleaning menstrual cups appropriately. And that, for me, um, means that you need to flash boil 
at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, at any opportunity throughout the menstrual cycle, and definitely at the end before you pack it away again, um, that having two cups is better than one, and not to wear both at the same time, but to mm -hmm. rotate out so that you can sterilize and um, make sure that you, you're, you know, you're not reinserting something that could possibly be a little bit contaminated. Um, that if you are in a, a toilet situation where you're just tipping out your menstrual cup, that's fine. Um, but at any opportunity throughout the day, if you are near a basin, if you're at home, then I would be using a suitable cleanser or cup wipe um, on the area so that you're just, act again, removing any microbes that might be there or minimising their chances of adhering and multiplying. Um, so it's about common sense. So, you know, you can wear them to bed at night, but that would be where I get up in the morning and put a different one in, um, you know, and change them frequently throughout the days, even if you don't think you need to. It would be at any opportunity when you toilet, you should be changing it or emptying it. Um, so those things, because there are no specific guidelines currently around the use of cups, there is a theoretical risk of, like there is with tampons, of toxic shock syndrome if it's, they're left in for too long because that's just another microbe that can grow in that space. Um, so to be able to minimise that would mean just good sanitation and sterilisation techniques around their use. Yeah, 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 yeah. excellent yeah. advice, yeah, excellent I, think, advice. I think, yeah, to know what to do yeah. with menstrual cups because, because there has been explosion, there has been but, explosion there's no but there's no specific guidelines, guidelines as, as, as such. As, as such. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So I guess I'll, so I I'd guess like to I'll, I'd touch like on a little bit about your PhD, about your PhD because, because I'm so excited, I'm so excited that you are doing that research in this area, area, which is so important. Can you explain a little about you what, you're about what you're going to be looking into? Looking into? Yeah, I can give you a little bit of information, not too much at this stage. Um, so <laughs> my area of interest in the PhD is looking at recurrent thrush. And I chose recurrent thrush because of all the things I deal with in clinical, in clinical practice, it's the most unpredictable and stubborn of things to get on top of. Uh, bacterial vaginosis is a walk in the park when you mm. compare to recurrent thrush conditions. And it doesn't mean that you can't address them. It just means that generally you're having to manipulate lots of things in somebody's life. So I'm working um, with people that have that. It's a clinical trial. We're using um, different interventions and then we're measuring what effect that actually has on that microbiome space um, over a period of time to see whether there's any noticeable improvements or how that may actually be having that impact in that area. Um, so I am fearful and excited about <laughs> embarking on, this, on that type of research. Um, I'm excited because... I think we need this sort of information. Um, and again, the bacteria in that area, there's quite a lot of research coming out about it. But when we look at funguses, and um, which is what thrush is, it's a mycose, there's not so much information, yet it is a problem for people. And, um, you know, the current medical treatment for recurrent thrush, if it's continuously happening, is to go on extended courses of the azole therapy which has different risks associated with it and it still has a relapse rate associated with it as well. So, um, you know, to break that type of cycle of pharmaceutical use when it's unneeded would be really amazing. Yeah, it sounds really yeah, exciting. Sounds really I, exciting. I, 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 I do see, I, I, see that I, I a lot in patients with recurring, recurring infections. Yeah. yeah. But is there anything else but you'd like to leave us with, like with, with that we with haven't touched on? I know we could talk for hours on this topic and I would love to speak with you again when you are in the middle of your PhD and finding out all this exciting stuff. But is there anything you'd like to leave us with for the audience? My main message when I talk to the public is that, you know, I know this is an area where we're not you know, we're not raised to talk about or to share information about and it's quite taboo. Yet our society is shifting so quickly it doesn't need to be taboo and it doesn't mean you have to talk about it to everybody but you mm -hmm. need to talk about it to the people that need to know about it. Um, so my take-home message is if, you know, have the conversation with your healthcare provider. Um, if they're not listening, you know, take it to another person. Don't be afraid to implement your own STI testing, to go and get swabs done um, at different, you know, as I said, the sexual health clinics are fantastic resources, which most states will have, um, because those type of things will give you peace of mind and allow you to, you know, check in and then move through it as well. And if you are experiencing recurrent symptoms, my advice would be is to go and get help with that as well, you know, because of the impact of it is not just on fertility, you know, it has impacts on other components of our life as well and what might be going on with our gynecological health so you know gynecological health awareness 
is a really important thing. Um, you know, that there's a lot of women and females or people that have vaginas in this world, mm-hmm. um, and they need to be able to gain access to good health care that you know accepts that and understands that and is willing to have that discussion. Yes, yeah, so important. Yes, yeah, so important. Now, I'm getting terrible now, feedback, getting terrible on, my feedback end, on my um, end, so I hope um, no one else is being no interfered by, interfered by this, this. But I will. But I, will I follow you myself, follow you and you myself, share some amazing information, information um, on your social. On your social. So, so just let people know the website and where website, people can where find people you. Can find you. Yeah. So if you hop over to my website, which is Intimate uh, Ecology E C O L O G Y dot com dot au, on there you'll find links to. Um, my Facebook page, you'll find links to the uh, educational services that I offer to my clinical services, which is also works by a referral model as well. Um, and just generally blog updates. I'm also on Instagram and there is a YouTube channel, which is just building. Um, so all of those areas, you'll be able to find information and I um, encourage you to share that around with your friends as well, because again, it's about awareness. If we can get some awareness in this area, we're going to improve the health of everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks for taking your time thanks today. Time today. And, and thanks so much thank for, all your, for all your efforts and your research and in your this research area, in because this area, because it is really, really changing, the changing the conversation. And improving your understanding uh, in this area. So I will be sure to to put those links in the show notes so people can get in touch with you. you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. What a pleasure. Excellent. Well, I'm sure I'll speak with you again. But thanks for speaking with me today. today. And for you at home, thanks for joining us. us. And I look forward to seeing you next time.